Development of Infamous Second Son began while the PlayStation 4 was still in the works. This project was being developed under the working title of Infamous 3. According to an interview with Game Informer, Nate Fox, director of all three games, said that the team had no idea what Sony's upcoming console was capable of, so they just winged it while working on Second Son. As more info about the PS4 came out, the studio decided that if they were going to make a game for a next-gen console, they were going to make sure that it took advantage of as many new features as possible. A lot of these features they were going to use wide in the DualShock 4. Second Son utilized the built-in speaker, the gyroscopic capability, the light bar, and of course, the touchpad. However, as exciting as it was for them to use these features, Sucker Punch had to be careful and implement them in a way that felt natural and not forced like it was a tech demo. When you're in the shoes of a studio like Sucker Punch, the last thing you want is having your game join the ranks of 1-2 Switch and Lair. The setting also played a major role in Second Son's development. Seattle, Washington is home to over 700,000 people, and it's the largest city in the Pacific Northwest. This city is famous for the Space Needle, the numerous coffee shops spread throughout the metropolis, the Seattle Science Center, and for being one of the biggest hubs for jobs and technical fields in the United States. Despite being based in the nearby city of Bellevue, Washington, the team at Sucker Punch had a goal to create an infamous game set in Seattle once development of the second title wrapped up. The reason Seattle was chosen as the setting for Second Son was because it's a city that's never really been explored in video games. It's not a place like New York City or Los Angeles, both of which have been done to death in every medium imaginable. Speaking as someone who was born, raised, and still lives in the mid-Atlantic, I can't help but roll my eyes whenever I see something set in New York City. Seattle, on the other hand, is a breath of fresh air for both the players and the developers. Once production began, the crew got to work on conducting field research in and around Seattle to use as reference when designing the game's environments. They took pictures of the streets and the various shops, and they even went as far as to get a license to use logos and signage of businesses throughout the city, places like Elephant Car Wash and Sonic Boom Records to name a few. The crew also went to surrounding forests to capture sound, pictures, and video. Just like the first two games, the soundtrack for Second Son was inspired by its setting. Infamous this one soundtrack was experimental and industrial, giving it that feel of life in the bustling city. The soundtrack for Infamous 2 went for a jazzy and more upbeat rhythmic tone, something you'd hear while walking through the French Quarter in New Orleans. For Infamous Second Son, the soundtrack was influenced by grunge. It's more aggressive and louder than the score from previous entries. With this game taking place in Washington, a place where the grunge scene flourished for a time, it's no surprise at all that the sound team decided to go with this style of music. The composers for this game consisted of Mark Canham, a veteran composer whose work was heard in both games and film. He also has a pretty good track record as well, composing the score for games such as Far Cry 2, a few of the driver titles, and the PlayStation 3 exclusive Killzone 2. Returning members of this team are Guns N' Roses members Brian Mantia and Melissa Reese. Oh yeah, and I found out that these two are actually a duo under the name Brian and Melissa, and they've done work for other video games like the Twisted Metal reboot, Mod Nation Racers, and they've even done a song or two for Bloodborne. And last but not least is film composer and director Nathan Johnson. He's composed music for the critically acclaimed movie Knives Out. He also directed music videos for an experimental band called Sun Lux. Just like the last game, this talented team of composers and musicians all came together to bring the world and the story to life through the soundtrack. As impressive as it was to make Seattle the backdrop for Second Son, doing so came at a cost. The real-world layout of the city just didn't mesh with the kind of gameplay that Sucker Punch was shooting for, so necessary changes had to be made. The layout of Seattle was drastically changed in order to give the player the mobility they need to navigate the city with their powers. This was honestly for the best. As much as I love seeing real-world cities come to life in video game form, there can be times where the setting itself can hinder the gameplay. As a matter of fact, it kind of did. The Space Needle is owned and managed by the Space Needle Holding Corporation. Because of this, Sucker Punch had to be careful with how it was portrayed, and as a result, the player is blocked from reaching the top of it during free roam. The only time it can be scaled is during a story mission. Second Son being set in Seattle and the game having a protagonist with different powers meant that the studio could now experiment with more rainy weather and particle effects. Believe it or not, but when the artists added more neon to the environment, the idea of neon powers was conceived and eventually added to the protagonist's arsenal. Motion capture was used again, and the technology used this time around has become a lot more advanced. Producer Brian Fleming states that the added authenticity of motion capture is important because it allows the player to get a handle on a character's state of mind through their facial expressions. Troy Baker and Travis Willingham were brought in to play Delson Rowe, the protagonist, and Reggie, who is Delson's older brother. The team spent a crazy amount of time with motion capture because they didn't just mocap the main cast and call it a day. Instead, Sucker Punch brought in nearly 100 people to do mocap for the 
NPCs. They brought in friends and family, and they even contacted casting agencies for extras. Extras would sit in a chair surrounded by cameras while a strobe light measured the shape and volume of their head and face. They were then told to move around a 360 camera setup so that their movements would be captured. To get a feel for different clothing styles, mannequins were used. Once the person is scanned, the designers would take the scan and fill in any blank spots. Each model consists of nearly 1.4 million polygons, and since that takes up a lot of space, the designers would have to compress it. On February 21st, 2013, Nate Fox announced Infamous Second Son at Sony's PS4 press conference in New York City. Nate shared his experiences at the 1999 Seattle WTO protest, and then he goes on to show off the trailer to the audience. Fans were excited and curious. The setting looked more dystopian in nature, with cameras on every street corner, military checkpoints lining the road, and an overall dreary vibe. Everyone had questions. What happened after the good ending in the last game? How did the world get like this? Is this game connected to the first two? And why are conduits back all of a sudden? And that brings us to this game's story. For this video, I'm going to be covering both Infamous Second Son and its expansion, First Light. Now let's see where these games take us. For the sake of simplicity, I'm only going to be going over the hero route because it's canon. The game opens up with text saying that seven years have passed since the emergence of conduits. As a response, the Department of Unified Protection, or DUP, was formed with the goal of detaining conduits, now rebranded as bioterrorists. It's believed that a majority of conduits have been imprisoned. Since the DUP was deemed a success, they're being phased out and handing over conduits to the US military. That prison transport will never arrive. Sorry for going on a tangent so early, but I have a huge issue with this setup already. Let me preface this by saying that I'm not asking for the writers to spoon feed me every single bit of info about a plot, I just want things to make sense. That said, this opening crawl doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The ending of Infamous 2 makes it very clear that every single living conduit on Earth perished because Cole activated the RFI. Heck, even people who never had their powers activated died too. If you had the conduit gene, the RFI was gonna kill you, no exceptions. My point is that the plot feels very forced. How did the conduit gene return? If Sucker Punch wanted this plot to work, Second Son would have to take place during the events of Infamous 1 or 2. At least then the story would be able to justify itself. Sorry for going on a tangent so early, it's just that the setup for this plot has always bugged me. Anyway, let's get back to the story. A truck holding prisoners is passing through a dense alpine forest in Washington state. In between shots of the forest is an indigenous reservation called Salmon Bay, a fishing village that lies near the waters of the Puget Sound. This reservation is home to a fictional indigenous tribe called the Akomish. The camera then cuts to the protagonist Delson Rowe climbing a rooftop, and when he approaches his canvas, the game gives us control, making the player hold the dual shot four sideways like a can of spray paint. When Sucker Punch said that they wanted to take advantage of the DS4, they weren't kidding. The player has to hold the controller sideways with one hand like they're spray painting and hold down R2 like it's a nozzle. It's kind of like the tagging minigame from Saints Row 2. This is going to be a sign activity once you make it to the open world. After tagging the billboard, Delson sees that the county sheriff is on the scene and he plots an escape route to a nearby longhouse so that he can establish an alibi. He jumps inside a fish guttery and startles the owner, whose name is Ben. Betty. Who's out there? It's just me, Betty. Delson. Would you put the stapler down? Seriously. Betty asks why Delson isn't at the get-together at the longhouse, and she doesn't buy his excuse. She knows he's up to trouble, but decides to cover for him anyways. Betty leaves and buys Delson some time to get to the longhouse. We open up a door that leads to a path to the longhouse, and we finally get to do some parkour. The parkour in Second Son feels a lot more smooth and fluent than it did in the last game. Delson's movement has less weight than Cole, allowing the player to more easily execute a last-second turn when trying to latch on to the correct obstacle. Other than that, though, there isn't much else I have to say about the parkour in Second Son, other than it's good. Delson makes it to the longhouse, but the sheriff already beat him there. That sheriff is his brother, Reggie Rowe. Reggie confronts Delson about his frequent arrest and delinquent behavior, but their argument is cut short when that truck from earlier speeds through and bulldozes a few cars before losing control and crashing. Reggie chases after the prisoners, and Delson searches the wreckage for survivors. He rescues a prisoner who thanks him, but his gratitude is short-lived when Reggie returns to the scene, causing 
him to panic and grab Delson. He fires smoke at Reggie and Delson grabs his hand, which briefly shows flashes of images before cutting to Delson lying on the ground. Delson wakes up and gets off the ground after the standoff, and out of nowhere he starts teleporting. Delson now has smoke powers. This is a shock to him because having these powers means that he's now labeled as a bioterrorist, and that makes him a target for the DUP. When Delson makes it up the road, the conduit from earlier knocks down Reggie and he dips. Delson saves Reggie from the upturned vehicle, but his powers go haywire and destroy the car. Reggie tries comforting Delson, telling him that he's not a bioterrorist, and assures him that his powers are going to come and go, treating it like a passing ailment. Yeah, ever since the last game where cities across the East Coast were decimated, public attitude attitude towards conduits had grown increasingly negative, which is ironic considering that Cole, a conduit, sacrificed his life and thousands more to save the world from threats like the Beast. I chalk it up to propaganda from the DUP. That explains why conduits were rebranded as bioterrorists. The brothers get themselves back together and they head back to Salmon Bay before that conduit beats them there. They reach the fish guttery from earlier and they find that the door is jammed and the conduit dashed through using his powers. With no other option, Delson does the same, surprising and terrifying the other villagers. We're introduced to Smoke Dash, where Delson can dash through a vent and launch himself at a great distance on the other end, and this is great for keeping up the momentum while doing parkour or if you're trying to shake off some enemies. Delson lands inside the fish guttery and goes to look for Betty. A door in front of him is blocked by smoldering rubble, so Delson picks up a nearby chain and swings it at the debris. This is going to be your melee weapon for the game. Delson's melee attack won't stay the same though, as you gain more powers, the way Delson Delson attacks the enemy with his chain plays out differently. With smoke, Delson will cloak the chain in smoke and fire and swing it like normal. When he has neon equipped, Delson's chain damages the enemy with more blunt force and can send them flying several feet away. And with Delson's video power, his chain transforms into this big ass sword with wider reach and damage. Sounds like he's a big fan of Berserk. After searching around, we find Betty arguing with that conduit. Delson demands that the guy change him back to normal, but he attempts to flee only to get stopped dead in his tracks. Delson grabs hold of the conduit's wrists, and he starts seeing visions of the guy's past. We're also treated to the first motion comic in the game. Just like Infamous 2, the motion comics are drawn in bright watercolor, and the art style is based on stencil art. My biggest issue with these is that Delson never narrates any of them until the end of the game. It's incredibly odd that everyone else except the protagonist gets a detailed backstory. Delson is pretty much a feature on his own album. We don't get to learn much about him outside of loading screen blurbs and throwaway lines. We also don't get much of Delson's thoughts from his own point of view. Stuff like what he's thinking about the current situation, his thoughts on the people around him, why he became a delinquent, you know, stuff like that. If the player got a better grip on who Delson is, he'd be a more engaging character. Delson gets a glimpse at the prisoner's past. The guy's name is Henry Daughtry. Henry, or Hank as everyone else calls him, was a violent repeat offender. He'd use his powers to rob banks, but eventually the DUP caught up with him and threw him into a prison called Curtin K, where conduits can't use their powers. Henry was tortured in Curtin K, and later he was to be transported to a military base. During the ride, he used a paperclip to free his hands from his bindings and messed up the convoy, which brings us to where we are now. The two wake up on the floor of the guttery, and Henry finds out that Delson was rooting around in his head. Henry warns Delson that if he's caught by the DUP, UP, he's gonna end up at Curtin K just like he was. After that, Henry tries speeding off and Delson tries stopping him, leading to a fight. During their fight, Henry says that Delson's life is going to be a lot harder now that he has powers. He tells him that his tribe is going to sell him out anyways because the woman in the DUP that's chasing after him has ways of making people talk, i.e. torture. Henry flees the fish guttery with Delson in pursuit only for the both of them to get held up at gunpoint by the DUP. His pleas for the soldiers to let him go are silenced after he gets encased in concrete. That woman he mentioned earlier walks up and expresses her disappointment in him. Delson tries playing it cool. We got him, right? I, uh, flushed that mean old conduit for you. Good job, everybody. Especially you, guys. Bioterrorist. Henry Daughtry. I was a bioterrorist. Conduit. He's a word used by traitors who sympathize with their cause. You're not a traitor, are you? That woman is Brooke Augustine, director of the DUP. Her goal is to round up as many conduits as possible so that they don't run loose and so she can study them while keeping them under her control. Augustine questions Delson about what Henry shared with him while the two were in the guttery, but Delson plays it smart and says that he heard nothing. She says that her and the DUP are in a war against bioterrorists and she's willing to do anything to make sure that every single one is wiped off the map. 
Delson responds by asking the right question at the wrong time. He asks Augustine if this war she's fighting makes her a bioterrorist too, and Augustine full on admits her hypocrisy, but justifies it by saying that sometimes you have to fight fire with fire. Augustine redirects her attention to Delson, and she resorts to intimidating him for answers by shoving concrete through his legs. Betty steps up and says that she might know what happened in there, but Delson tells her to not get involved. Augustine proposes an ultimatum. Unless Delson tells her what happened in that fish guttery, she's gonna torture everyone in the tribe until she gets an answer. This is where we're given our first karma moment. Stand up and take all the heat for the Akomish, or save yourself and say nothing while Augustine terrorizes the tribe. In Second Son, there aren't a lot of karma moments, which is weird because with this game being the next major step for the franchise, you'd expect these to have more presence. These scenarios are few and far between, and making a choice, whether it be good or evil, feels so underwhelming. This is disappointing because with the new protagonist, you want to try to get into their head a little, try to see how they rationalize their decisions to themselves and how their choices have an impact on how other characters view them. Delson admits to being a conduit and says that he got his powers from Henry. Augustine isn't satisfied with what she heard and shoves more spikes into Delson's leg. She moves over to Betty demanding a straight answer and drives spikes into her legs as well. The game fast forwards one week later to Delson waking up in the longhouse where it's been made into a makeshift hospital. X-ray scans show that the Comish were tortured and mutilated, with Augustine's concrete appearing in many different parts of their bodies. Dulcin walks over to where Betty is resting, and she's not in good condition. She says that nobody in the Akomish sold Delson out to Augustine despite being tortured for answers. Even then, none of the tribe blames Delson for the attack on their reservation. Betty says that Delson isn't like any of the other bioterrorists, and she assures him that once she gets enough rest, she'll be fine. Reggie arrives, and he's relieved to see that Delson is okay. It turns out that Delson is the only one who was able to walk away from those injuries since he's a conduit. The same can't be said for the villagers, though. Anyone who got hit with Augustine's concrete is going to die unless Augustine herself or someone Someone with her powers removes them. Delson decides that the only way to save his people is to go to Seattle and bring Augustine back to Salmon Bay, but then he has a revelation. He doesn't need to bring her back. He just needs to bring back her powers. So it turns out that Delson's real power is the ability to copy the powers of other conduits by grabbing their hand. Thank goodness Delson did not shake hands with John in Infamous 2. On the road, Delson breaks down his plan to Reggie. His plan is to search for Augustine, absorb her powers, and run straight back to Salmon Bay and heal everyone. You swing by the space, Neil, always wanted to see it, and then we're back home to save some lives. You do realize when we hit the town, there's a fair chance the town's gonna you know, hit back. This isn't gonna be an easy trip though. Reggie says that more than half the population of Seattle is on edge from conduits, and they won't welcome Delson with open arms, even if he tries staying on everyone's good side. Reggie slams the brakes on his truck, and the road is blocked by a DUP checkpoint with signs of a battle having taken place there. Delson approaches a cart full of bright glowing objects, and he absorbs whatever they contain and sees visions of himself shooting smoke out of his hands. We now have our primary method of attack. Reggie disapproves of him gaining more power and says that doing so is only making things worse, but Delson fires back and says that if he wants to take on Augustine, he has to take whatever he can get. Reggie wants to avoid a direct confrontation with Augustine, and the two start arguing about a better solution. A woman in the distance calls out for help, and Reggie leaves Delson behind to see what's going on. While Reggie is out saving people, the game introduces blast shards. In Second Son, the blast shards behave very differently now. For starters, you can only get them from DUP checkpoints or drones. Secondly, the blast shards in this game don't increase Delson's power capacity. Instead, they're used to purchase new abilities in the skill tree. Reggie calls and tells us to meet him where he's at because he needs help with a bus full of relief workers that can't move due to an obstruction in the road. Delson gets there, and he destroys the obstruction using his powers, hoping that this would ease tensions between him and the passengers. This has the opposite effect because Reggie locks the doors to the bus and says that the passengers are scared of Delson because of his powers, and that if he boards, they're gonna get off. Reggie decides that he's gonna leave Delson behind so that he can drop the workers off in Seattle and come back to pick him up. This was a missed opportunity for a karma moment. Delson walks down the road and comes across more destruction and debris littering the area. A message from the DUP on a loudspeaker plays, warning both drivers and pedestrians to steer clear of the Route 520 bridge because they're prepping it for decommission. Reggie hits up Delson on the phone, but the signal is weak and we can just barely make out a sentence. 
Delson follows the tunnel and comes across a man wearing body armor and a balaclava. When he asks if he needs help, the guy opens fire on him and Delson falls to the ground. The shots aren't fatal though, and Delson, realizing that he has higher pain tolerance than normal people, takes on the enemies head first. This is where we get our first taste of actual combat. In Second Son, you'd no longer have to hold down L2 to aim anymore. The shooting in this game feels smoother than before. Landing a shot on an enemy is cathartic to watch. Enemy response to getting hit by projectiles is more dynamic as well. They'll clutch where they got hit, look around for cover, or even scan the area for Delson. Enemies will also utilize their own tactics. They'll split up and force you to hunt them down one by one. They'll gang up on you and try to slow you down so they can shower you with bullets. And later on in the game, there will be enemies with powers who just jump all over the place to disorient and distract you and keep you guessing. Once the thugs are taken down, one of them surrenders and you're given the option to either subdue him for good karma or execute him for evil karma. This is pretty much a substitute for the Arc Restraint in Bioleach. This system does a pretty great job at maintaining the momentum during an encounter. Delson dispatches or restrains an enemy and he just keeps on moving, keeping the momentum of the fight alive and preventing it from grinding to a screeching halt. We make it into the tunnel and onto the Route 520 bridge and yeah, <laughs> yeah, they decommissioned it alright. It's a huge mess. There's nothing left here except for debris and the concrete used to tear this bridge up. Delson jumps down and starts searching for Reggie, and he happens across another core relay. This ability allows Delson to launch himself into the air off the roof of a car, pretty much the same ability that Cole had. Continuing across the bridge, we find yet another core relay. Maybe it's just me, but I don't feel like I've earned these powers. The game just introduces them way too quickly. Watching a character learn and get used to their powers and pick up more stuff along the way is one of the main draws to these types of narratives. Imagine if Ichigo magically learned how to control his inner hollow without any training from the visors and then went on to defeat Dreamjow in their final fight using his Bankai. Anyway, Delson absorbs the relay and the next power we get are static thrusters. Well, they're not actually the static thrusters, they're just, you know what I mean. As Delson treks his way across the bridge, he sees that the bus Reggie was driving is now turned over. He runs towards it, but the bridge starts to shake and the bus falls straight into the water. Thankfully, Reggie was never in the bus when it fell. He's actually hanging off the edge of what's left of the bridge. Delson sprints over and saves Reggie from falling. They've made it to the city limits, but the issue now is crossing through the DUP checkpoint that leads to Seattle. Instead of getting into a fight with the DUP, Reggie wants to get Delson past the checkpoint without incident. On the way to the checkpoint, Reggie says that there are soldiers that were given superpowers by the DUP themselves. Although not as powerful as someone born with the conduit gene, these guys still pack enough of a punch to take down Delson. The brothers arrive at the checkpoint, and Reggie's plan is to hit up his connections in the Seattle Police Department and see what they can find. When it's time for Delson to do a conduit scan, he fails it and the DUP opens fire on them. The two of them fight past the soldiers, but they get separated during the shootout. So what was the plan here in the first place? Have Delson fail a conduit scan and then take on a bunch of guards? Reggie calls and says that he has access to the Seattle Police Department's database, and his findings show that the DUP has a tight grip on the city. If Delson can destroy one of their mobile command centers, that would take the heat off of him for a bit and give him some breathing room. Delson goes and attacks a nearby command center and destroys the main power core. Doing so shuts down the surveillance equipment in the area, but a soldier cloaked in concrete holding a minigun steps off and opens fire on the crowd. These dudes can be tough at times, they're bullet sponges and they deal a lot of damage. When their health is low, they shelter themselves with concrete so they can heal up. All you have to do from here is just approach their tent from behind and deliver the finishing attack. The enemies are finally cleared out, and Reggie calls and suggests that instead of seeking out Augustine for her powers, Delson could just drain concrete powers from a fallen DUP agent. Reggie also says that even if his theory is wrong, the two of them can still head home. Delson walks over to an unconscious DUP agent and grabs his hand. Nothing. Knowing how stubborn Reggie is, Delson lies and says that he couldn't check to see if he was able to absorb anyone's powers because he's being swarmed by more troops. Probably for the best that he did that, Delson hits up Reggie and asks if his connections in the Seattle PD know of the whereabouts of any core relays in the city, and Reggie flat out refuses to reveal where they're at because he doesn't want Delson gaining any more powers, but Delson reminds him what they're up against. You keep tapping him for more powers? No, forget it. Wow, my own brother wants me to fight the ultra-mega bioterrorist of all time with less powers. Look, I didn't say that. Well... I guess I shouldn't put it off then. Better go straight on to Augustine now and get it over with. Not sure what's gonna happen. All right, all right, I get it. Look, just stay away from Augustine and I'll send you the ones I know of.
As I mentioned earlier, Blast Charge are now a currency used to purchase new abilities in the skill tree. I'm not a big fan of this thing. Well, in the context of Infamous, I'm not a big fan of it. You see, skill trees are fine for the most part, but for Infamous, it kind of feels phoned in. Sure, it encourages exploration through asking the player to seek out collectibles scattered throughout the map, but that's all there is to it. Now, I didn't talk about it in my last two Infamous videos, but I much prefer the progression system in those games than Second Son. Sure, those systems are straightforward and barebones, but they encourage you to get creative with how you chose to tackle enemies. If your attacks were more creative, and if your attack incapacitated more than one enemy, you'd gain more experience points, which is basically just currency. Hell, in the second game, you were required to take down enemies in a certain fashion to unlock certain powers. Not only that, but for other powers, you had to play side missions to unlock them. In Second Son, getting new powers and upgrading them is done by going on a collectathon and Dulcin absorbing core relays without much stopping him. Outside of pushing your karma meter whichever direction, there's very little reason for seeking out and fighting enemies during free roam. With new powers, new enemies, and new enemy types, not having a system that rewards players for using creative attacks and thinking outside the box was a missed opportunity. This is why I think the progression system from First Light is an improvement. It rewards you skill points for completing various challenges, whether they be in the open world or the challenge arena but I'm gonna save my thoughts about that until it's time to talk about First Light way later into the video. With the brothers finally in Seattle, their quest to save their tribe finally begins. Now that we've broken into Seattle, we can free roam and move around the city as we please. Let me just say that Infamous Second Son is one of the most gorgeous looking games I've played. With the new leap in technology, Sucker Punch was no longer bound by the limits of the PlayStation 3. The environment looks more detailed, weather effects are pretty good, neon from buildings and the street stands out more during nighttime, and the civilians don't look copy pasted from one another. That's the thing though, beauty is only skin deep. This sandbox looks pretty, but what does it have to offer? For all the praise I gave Second Son's rendition of Seattle, the world itself feels pretty empty. The introduction to this game's story and setting raises expectations, and as the player, you'd expect a lot of side content to be waiting for you once the game gave you the freedom to move around. Well, there are side missions, a lot of them in fact, but they're all simple and repetitive. The game has you doing stuff like destroying a DUP command center, playing Where's Waldo with an undercover DUP agent, finding and destroying hidden cameras, tracking down collectibles, doing stencil art, and finally, the one that got everyone hyped, District Showdown. Guess what? Another billboard is covered by a bioterrorist. Whatever will I do? I recognize your voice, sir. I don't find this funny. We will handle you. All right, lady, bring it on. It should be noted that each side activity you complete lowers the DUP's influence in a district. Once their influence is down to 30%, you unlock a district showdown where Delson faces off against a whole armada of DUP agents and all you have to do is clear them out. I mentioned earlier that the world in this game is empty. The world itself doesn't give off that dystopian vibe that the first trailer showed us. I expected a higher presence of DUP soldiers in the streets, but they are few and far between. Outside of a few APCs patrolling the roads, the odd DUP agent on the sidewalks and the occasional bioterrorist checkpoint, the DUP almost feels like an afterthought. In Infamous 2, the militia felt like more of a threat, and those guys were just a bunch of rednecks waving around guns. The militia would snatch people off the streets, they'd start gunfights out of nowhere with the cops or enemy factions, and hell, I remember there'd be times in the game where militia soldiers would just randomly fire into a crowd of people. Dude, the dustmen from the first game were more of a threat than the DUP, and those were only a bunch of homeless dudes with rifles. My only solution to making the DUP a bigger threat in Second Son would be to borrow the social status system from the Assassin's Creed games. If the player wants to get rid of their notoriety, then they'll have to go out of their way to decrease it just like in Assassin's Creed. Now, this solution isn't perfect, and I'd imagine that a lot of work would go into implementing it, but it would make the DUP more of an overall threat, both narratively and gameplay-wise. Continuing with the plot, Delson seeks out three core relays and gets some new powers. Comet Drop, Sulfur Bomb, and Cinder Missile. Comet Drop is pretty much Thunder Drop. Sulfur Bomb is a stun move that makes enemies cough, which also leaves them open for an instant takedown. And Cinder Missile is a grenade launcher that has its own storage capacity that can be refilled by draining smoke. Delson getting these powers in so little time is like playing Nocturne and learning skills like Deathbound or Heatwave right after you leave the hospital. Delson, ecstatic about his new abilities, tells Reggie to locate more core relays for him, but Reg refuses and says that he won't move forward with finding any leads on Augustine unless Delson agrees to lay low. 
which he does. Later on, Reggie calls us and says that he found out that the DUP has a communication network that's coordinating the movements of the other districts. The antenna for this network is located at the Space Needle. When we arrive there, we find that the DUP has mounted all this garbage and communication equipment on the side and even on the top of the structure. You're not an evil dystopian army unless you can find some arbitrary excuse to ruin some landmark. The plan here is to climb all the way to the top of this thing and knock out their communication network. By the way, you'd better enjoy this mission while you can, because like I said at the start of the video, you can't climb the Space Needle in Free Roam. This is the only time in the game that you can climb it. It's a real bummer too, because when that first trailer showed that shot of the Space Needle, I think we all had the same idea. While scaling the tower, the brothers speculate that Delson can only copy powers from anyone whose powers came from the Conduit Gene. Trying to copy from anyone who's given powers by Augustine yields no results. Betty gives us a call and asks Delson what he's up to, and he says he's at the Space Needle. Well, leaving out the climbing part, of course. She then asks for a postcard and says her goodbyes. I hope you weren't looking forward to any decent character development in this game because there's very little to be found. Another issue I have with Second Son is that the characters feel so flat, underwhelming, underdeveloped, and underutilized. I'm on board with Delson being the delinquent archetype, but I also wanted to learn why he became that way in the first place. What drove his need to rebel against authority? Why does he vandalize property? Was it trauma, boredom, the need for attention? Well, we never get those answers because Delson never opens up about who he was before the events of the game. Reggie, on the other hand, is the overbearing by-the-books police officer archetype who refuses to let anything slide whenever he's around. He also doesn't like conduits, likely falling for propaganda spread by Augustine and her army. He believes that they're a threat and thinks that his brother having powers isn't anything to be excited over. This alone would have made for an interesting dynamic between the two, with Delson trying to convince Reggie that not all conduits are evil, and Reggie, depending on your karma, either accepts conduits and standing by their side, or reinforcing his prejudice about them and going against Delson. You do realize when we hit the town, there's a fair chance the town's gonna, you know, head back? What does that even mean? It means that Seattle has half a million people that aren't exactly thrilled about the bioterrorists that are already there. You think they're gonna welcome you? No, but I'm gonna be different, okay? Oh, I'm okay. not there doing what they do. I'm there to save lives. I'm gonna be like Superman. I'll be yeah. healing the sick. The hero. And... What, you think they're gonna throw you a parade? Wake up, man. Instead, it all just ends with Reggie being on the fence in regards to his stance on conduits. Now, I'm not a one side or the other type of person, but Reggie constantly being confused on where he stands on conduits got really annoying, and I feel like more could have been done with that aspect of his character. Getting back to the Space Needle, Delson makes it to the top and finds all the communication equipment up there, but before he can destroy it, he's met with resistance from the DUP. Another new enemy type is introduced, and these guys are called Bishops. They surround themselves with concrete, and they have the ability to keep Delson's feet stuck to the ground for a short time, leaving you open for attack, which means you can't stay in one place for too long while fighting these guys. To take them down, all you have to do is just pelt them with normal projectiles until there's an opening. Once you see one, you can take down the Bishop by firing at their exposed body. Bishops have more defensive capabilities as well. They can create shields for their comrades, and they can even heal allies. These guys should definitely be dealt with first before engaging with other enemies. Once the squad of DUP agents is subdued, Delson drains another core relay and learns Orbital Drop. This was the move used in the trailers and TV spots for the game that got everyone hyped. To use abilities like Orbital Drop, you have to fill up a meter called Karma Bomb, which is filled by performing good or evil actions depending on your alignment. Once it's filled, you hit down on the D-pad to execute the Orbital Drop, where Delson flies high in the air and performs a high-speed dive bomb on the way down, leaving behind a massive explosion upon impact. I like that the Karmic Overload ability from the first game makes somewhat of a return here in Second Sun. Karmic Overload was an ability where if the Karma Meter was full, Cole would get unlimited power for a short amount of time. What Second Son did was take this ability, and instead of giving you unlimited power, it gave you a big move to finish fights with. Delson kicks off his orbital drop and destroys the communication equipment on the Space Needle, cleaning it up in the process. I really wish the Space Needle was used as a battleground way later in the game, because fighting on top of it after so much buildup would have given a moment like that more impact. Delson is happy that he was able to take back this part of the city, but this is only the beginning. The DUP still has control over the other districts. Kicking the DUP out of Seattle is going to take some time. In spite of this, Delson decides to send a message to not just the DUP, but to everyone in the city. He goes and spray paints one of his designs on the flag at the top of the Space Needle, letting everyone know that there's a new hero in town. Hey, Reg. You see it from down there? <laughs> Are you kidding? People in Portland can see it. I just want to let the dupes know I'm here, man. 
Over in a security room, Augustine sees all of this unfold. She now knows that Delson is in Seattle. Meanwhile on the ground, people are talking about Delson's tag and he goes on to earn the nickname Bannerman. Wow, that's gotta hurt, man. Delson put in all that work to not only get an edge over the DUP, but to also send a message to the people, but at the end of it all, he's just Bannerman. Reggie tells Delson to disrupt the DUP's operations around the city while he goes and looks for weeds on the escaped conduits from Salmon Bay. Delson stops by a nearby TV shop and he sees a news report on what he did at the Space Needle. The reporters say that they don't know what the symbol means and they don't even know who Delson is, but one thing they do know is that Seattle's bioterrorist population has grown by one. The station then runs a story about a conduit serial killer who is sniping innocent people on the city streets with a body count of 21 victims. Reggie suggests that they go after the serial killer and not only bring them down but to see what they know about Augustine and in the process drain their powers. I get that Reggie has very little to work with, but why would he think that some random serial killer who just so happens to have superpowers would have a good weed on Augustine? Regardless, we have to go after them. We're then ordered by Reggie to go check out one of the crime scenes. Before Delson gets there, Reggie tells him to go non-lethal since he'll be dealing with cops. Delson makes it past the police and enters the crime scene. The alleyway leading to the body has this bright violet pink or whatever this color is substance splattered all over the walls leading toward the victim. The scene of the victim's body has neon graffiti with skulls and syringes decked all over while the body itself is hanging upside down. Delson wonders about the powers that could have killed this guy and Reggie starts doubting whether or not Delson will be able to even copy the powers of whoever did this. Reggie, think for a moment. If this wasn't a natural conduit, you'd more than likely be seeing Augustine's soldiers firing neon from their hands. If not that, then there's a bigger problem. Sirens begin to blare and the DUP have discovered yet another victim of this conduit serial killer. They've cordoned off the area and we have to fight through a bunch of these guys to get a look at the crime scene. Reggie meanwhile has not been able to identify the first victim we found. After taking care of the enemies and somehow not contaminating the crime scene, we find this victim strung up on a water fountain with graffiti swirling around them. We take another pick of the victim for Reggie and he gets a positive ID. The guy was a drug dealer with a huge rap sheet and if we can find their stash, we might be able to find out who he was dealing for and why he was targeted like this. When Delson takes a look at the stash, he gets blasted by the sniper from a nearby billboard and he decides to close in on their hiding spot. This conduit moves real fast and they even manage to escape from Delson. Since we lost our killer, we decide to check out their sniper nest and see if they left behind any clues. Once there, we find out that this sniper is actually a woman going off of the um, garments left behind. <laughs> the name Brent is graffitied into the wall, but only the sniper knows who that is. We take some pictures of the sniper nest and while doing so, we come across graffiti of a person that looks way too detailed to be random. Reggie decides to run the name Brent through the police database and see who comes up. He manages to get a match and finds a Brent Walker, a man with a record with one arrest two years ago for minor drug possession. Turns out that two months after his arrest, he was found dead in an alleyway from a quote, single puncture wound of unknown origin through the chest. End quote. We get the address of where this went down and head on over there. On the way to the alley, Delson notices that the woman he's chasing has a great hatred for drug dealers. But then the gears start turning. If the victims of these murders are all drug dealers, why is the media making it seem like this is some serial killer picking off random victims? Delson believes that the DUP is spinning this story to the media so that they can cause a panic and make people fear conduits even more. If they wanted to keep panic levels to a minimum, the DUP would have told the public that the only ones in danger are drug dealers. Reggie just brushes this off as conspiracy nonsense and says that their job is to keep the panic levels low. I find it incredibly odd that Reggie of all people still believes in the propaganda that the DUP is putting out there. Hell, he saw the x-ray scans of what Augustine did to the Akomish in Salmon Bay. At this point, Reggie should have realized that the DUP, the people that he claims is there for his and everyone's protection, are the same people who attacked the village that he vowed to protect. On the way to where Brent died, we come across another karma opportunity where we have to stop a drug deal in progress. Pretty easy. We make it to the alleyway where Brent was killed, and it's been transformed into a shrine dedicated to him. It's got candles, pictures, and lots of graffiti. Whoever this sniper is, Brent must have meant a lot to her. Delson looks around a bit, and he finds a bag for a restaurant in the city called Olaf's, which is right next to one of the biggest neon signs in Seattle, and he decides to swing by to see if she'll be there. We get into position and stake the area out from a nearby rooftop. Hours roll by, and the conduit arrives on the roof next to where Delson is staking out. Delson pops out and tries grabbing her hand, which only transfers her powers to him and shows us a small glimpse of her past. The two of them get back on their feet and the woman flees with Delson in pursuit. We now have neon powers. Delson can use the neon dash, but for only a short time. If you upgrade it, you'll eventually be able to dash without stopping. With the neon dash, Delson can not only run faster, but he can leap high off of obstacles if you press the X button while dashing. 
combined with gliding, this makes moving around Seattle less of a pain. Delson spends some time chasing this mystery woman around the city until she stops on top of a skylight and shatters the glass, sending both her and Delson plummeting straight to the ground. The woman accuses Delson of being one of Augustine's agents, and he fails at trying to convince her otherwise, kicking off a boss fight. In order to gain the upper hand, you have to drain Neon from these panels so that the conduit can't heal herself. With Neon gradually becoming limited in supply as the fight goes on, you have to be careful about taking damage, because when the screen goes to grayscale, it'll be some time before your health regenerates, and by that time she'll be hot on your trail. The woman is finally subdued, and when Delson moves in to try and restrain her, he gets a better look at her past. Her name is Abigail Walker, or as she likes to be called, Fetch. Fetch's power is activated at a young age. Her parents reported her to the DUP, and she and her brother Brent ran away from home and became transients. The siblings moved from city to city, having very little money and always having to keep their heads down. One day, they meet some drug dealers who got them addicted to what they were selling. Eventually, though, their addiction took a toll on them, and they began having painful withdrawals. At one point, Fetch she notices that her stash is missing, and she thinks that Brent stole it from her. The two get into a heated argument, and Fetch loses control, killing her brother with her powers. After that, the DUP finally catch up to her in a distraught state, and they bring her to Curtin K. There, the DUP taught Fetch how to hone her powers. On the day of the crash in Salmon Bay, Fetch flees to Seattle, vowing to kill every single drug dealer she finds in a bid to avenge her brother, and to make sure that no one else suffers the same way she did because of drugs. Reggie makes it to the building where Delson and Fetch are at, and he gets his brother back on his feet. He says he's gonna take her somewhere where Augustine won't find her, and where she won't be able to hurt anyone else. Delson and Reggie start arguing over the ethics of Fetch's murders. Delson wants to save Fetch because he feels like he can redeem her, but Reggie objects, saying that they can't save every single conduit that they come across. Fetch tries to make a run for it, but Reggie grabs hold of her. The player now has a choice. You can either redeem Fetch and teach her self-control, and teach her that senseless murder and violence isn't the only way to take apart Seattle's illegal drug trade, or you can corrupt her and unleash her on anyone who dares get in her way, even innocent people. Delson decides to take responsibility for Fetch, and Reggie lets her go. When Delson gets outside, he tells Reg that Fetch could help them out with finding Augustine, but Reggie disagrees and says that someone like that shouldn't be running free and that Delson is a different kind of conduit. They come to an agreement, and Reggie sends Delson the coordinates of different core relays around town. Delson then contacts Fetch, asking her to tag along with him while he drains the relays. Also, I couldn't believe it myself, but Delson full-on makes a Silent Hill reference, and I cannot unhear that. Hey, uh, you guys seen a girl, kind of short, purple hair? The new abilities that Delson gets is a slight mod to his Neon Blast, Stasis Bubble, and Phosphor Beam. The Neon Blast mod shows glowing weak points on enemies that, if fired at, will either subdue or kill them, giving you the respective karma. Stasis Bubble is a stun move where enemies are sent floating in the air for a short period of time. This is good for finishing them off or retreating from a fight that's too much for you. And finally, Phosphor Beam is just like Cinder Missile. It's a grenade launcher. That's it. As for the Karma Streak power, it's called Radiant Sweep. Delson uses a wide-range Stasis Bubble, floats in the air for a bit, and then he unleashes a barrage of Neon on the enemies, causing a contained explosion for anyone that was hit. You know, I'm starting to notice that these are pretty much the same powers as Smoke. I think that each power type would stand out more if they had different abilities alongside their own set of pros and cons. This would encourage players to experiment a bit and see which class of power would suit them in their method of tackling enemies. While Delson and Fetch are running around and draining Blast Cores, Delson spends time mentoring her and teaching her that killing people isn't always the answer. Delson isn't trying to be Gandhi or anything, but he clearly he values human life, and he knows what he and every single conduit on Earth are capable of. As the mission goes on, Fetch begins taking a non-lethal approach. Now she's tying up enemies and leaving them incapacitated. It's clear that Delson's teachings are starting to get through to her. At the end of the mission, Fetch realizes that going after the dealers is small time, and it's not having much of an effect on keeping drugs off the streets. She decides that the best way to tackle this issue is to move up the food chain a bit and start going after the suppliers. Fetch arranges a meat spot so that her and Delson can get to work taking down the suppliers. She never shows up, but she instead calls us and says that she found out a major drug shipment arrived in the marina, and the drugs are stashed away in one of the houseboats. The reason Fetch was late was because she was busy pressing one of the dealers for details on the shipment until he eventually squealed. After taking down the goons and finding the stash of drugs, Delson decides to tag each houseboat with his stencil art so that Fetch knows which ones to destroy. When I first played Second Son, I thought that the tagging minigame was gimmicky and just a way to force people 
people to use the gyroscopic control in the DualShock 4, but after doing some tagging around the city, I found it to be a pretty fun distraction. Holding the controller sideways like a spray paint can and using the R2 button like a nozzle felt cathartic. And seeing the end result of Delson's vandalism is always a treat. The way that Delson does his stencil art is contextual. It depends on the environment, what part of the city he's in, and the object or objects that are being used as a canvas. Karma also plays a role because the player can choose to spray paint something that will shift the meter depending on what they chose. Stencils done with good karma are friendly, humorous, and lighthearted. Stencils done with evil karma are mean-spirited and full of dark humor. Whichever one you choose will lower the DUP's influence over a district by at least 10%. I love how this implies that the stencil art hurt the DUP's feeling so bad that some of them decided to pull out of that part of the city. <laughs> After tagging all the houseboats, Delson takes out more enemies and joins Fetch on a nearby rooftop so that the two of them can watch the fireworks as she lights them all up. The explosions are... lackluster. When the houseboats are destroyed, the duo decides to tail a truck containing a shipment of drugs headed to a warehouse. As they tail the truck, Fetch reveals that she was imprisoned at Curtin K for seven years, and during those seven years, she was trained and tortured by Augustine. In a twisted sense, Curtin K felt like home to her. They arrive at the warehouse, and they continue their usual routine of kicking ass. When they check out the truck to see what's inside, it turns out that this group of drug dealers also specializes in human trafficking, and we free the women trapped on it. Once the two are alone, Delson and Fetch share a tender moment together. Fetch says that Delson saved her, and then she fakes out a potential romance with him. By the way, if you play the evil side of these missions, it ends with them having sex. I'm not kidding at all. I read the part where I put a hole through the hater. Ooh, golden age of television. Oh, man. I got all this energy now. I gotta burn it off. I mean, there's plenty of activists out there. You wanna there. hook up? Activists can wait. Hmm. Hmm. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You, know, you, you wanna go someplace where you know, our bodies don't get... Riddled by ballista and foreplay. Oh, no place for the week. <laughs> <laughs> the next morning, Fetch calls and Delson tells her that he needs to go and pick up some more weeds on Augustine. She thinks that her brother would have been proud of her, seeing how she shut down a drug and human trafficking ring all in the span of one night. Delson's next move is to see if he can cross the bridge into the Lantern District. With how much control the DUP has over Seattle, this is not going to be an easy task. It's time to enter the Lantern District. On the way there, we're ambushed by some DUP agents, one of which fires a smoke bomb at us that promptly gets drained. Everything's fine for the most part. Delson's taking down enemies like usual, and then he runs into Augustine, who seems to be waiting for us. Augustine notices that Delson has become a lot stronger since their last encounter a couple weeks back. She also knows about Delson's ability to use more than one power, but she wants to see it for herself up close. Then she lights up several neon panels and asks Delson to demonstrate his neon powers for her, but Delson keeps sticking to to a story that he doesn't know what she's talking about. Then, Augustine summons a souped-up DUP agent and sicks him on Delson as a way to force him to switch to Neon. After trying and failing to do any kind of damage to the guy, Delson drains one of the panels and Augustine is impressed. This boss fight isn't so difficult. All you have to do is just duck and dodge while waiting for an opening so that you can deal damage. Once the concrete brute is finished off, Delson asks if he can borrow some of Augustine's powers. Not a lot, but just enough to be able to pull the concrete free from his neighbors. The request is of course denied and she traps Delson's legs in concrete and offers to let him work alongside her in Seattle. Delson refuses, and he makes a half-hearted attempt at trying to drain her powers. Then, out of nowhere, Delson, <laughs> Delson starts floating for no reason, and he's dropped into the Lantern District. Once he arrives there, Delson is contacted by an unknown caller who says that they're a big fan of his. They saw his work at the Space Needle, and they want to help him take back Seattle. Delson accepts the unknown caller's assistance, and he says that he can start by helping him look for one of the escaped conduits from Salmon Bay in the Lantern District. Lucky for us, this guy already has a lead. He tells us that the DUP is taking suspected conduits to a holding facility downtown. If Delson is able to disrupt the convoy that's cutting through the Lantern District, he might be able to find who he's looking for. The caller also reveals that their name is Eugene. Delson makes it to the overpass where the convoy will be passing through, and he forms a plan. He's gonna weaken the support beams beneath the overpass, and when the convoy drives over it, it'll fall right through. By the way, this overpass has a homeless camp right beneath it, so I want to hope that Delson at least warned these guys of his scheme beforehand. Delson gets in position, and the convoy arrives as planned, falling straight through the road. Once the plan begins, Delson doesn't have any idea what he's supposed to be looking for, and Eugene suggests looking for buses. 
Once the raid on the convoy is over, Delson tries investigating one of the buses, but he's interrupted after a helicopter crashes into him and knocks him out for some time. Delson wakes up and gets Eugene on the phone to ask about where the buses went, but Eugene says that they're long gone. He also reveals that he tapped into the DUP's communications and he sends Delson a phone app so that he can do the same thing. With this game being made not too long after the smartphone boom of the early 2010s, that sounds far more believable than Cole's cell phone being a Swiss army knife that can do whatever Moya modified it to do. The app not only allows us to listen in on DUP chatter, but it can also tell us where the communication is coming from. We track the signal down to one of the buses and take down some DUP guys, but the bus is empty. Delson tries calling Eugene to see if he knows where the second bus is at, but he doesn't answer. While tracking the signal to the second bus, chatter from one of the agents seems to suggest that they're being attacked by another conduit. When we get to the bus, there's this huge sword stabbed into the roof. There's also no occupants inside as well. What kind of power is this? Is this what those DUP agents on the radio were talking about? Making it to the final bus, we see these armored dudes with wings attacking the DUP. Okay, now someone has to be behind this. There has to be an explanation for a bunch of guys with wings flying around. The third bus is empty, and Dulson thinks that there might be a conduit that's controlling these creatures. Also, Eugene just so happens to get back on the phone right after we take down those enemies at the third bus. He tells us that a conduit dropped a vest in the Lantern District after fleeing the ambush on the convoy. Dulson goes to where the vest was dropped, and he hypothesizes that one of the conduits may have used a porta potty to get the vest off without anyone seeing. He goes and checks out every porta potty he can find until he stumbles upon one with a conduit in there who flees. Delson gives chase, but the conduit gets picked up by one of those angels from earlier. The angels attack Delson, and the escapee manages to shake him off. These angel enemies are pretty weak, and they're easy to fight. You can melee them, and they go down in one hit. They don't even take that many hits from a regular blast to go down. Reggie makes it to the Lantern District and contacts Delson, who gives Reg a rundown of what's been going on. Delson decides to go back to square one, and he starts searching the market for an escaped conduit. One of the conduits notices Delson looking for him, and he makes a run for it, and the chase brings them to a crane, where the guy jumps and one of the angels grabs him. We lose the conduit, and we're ambushed by a gang of Russian criminals called the Occurrence. There are basically mafia types. They don't really play a huge role in the game's story until Fetch's DLC. The enemies are subdued, and Delson tells Reggie that he lost sight of the conduit. Reggie has a plan, and he tells Delson to meet him at one of the porta potties in the market. He gets there, and Reggie steps out of the porta potty wearing one of the conduit vests. Reggie's plan is to have Delson chase him around the market so that their pursuit draws the attention of one of the angels and brings him back to where the conduit controlling them is hiding. Since they can see each other's phone on the GPS, Delson will have an easier time tracking down Reggie. As the brothers run around the market, Reggie puts on his poor acting skills. I have a bioterrorist! Run away in fear, for I have powers! Horrible! Ugly! Big spirited superpowers! Eventually, Reggie gets snatched by one of the angels and Delson goes to where he's at on the GPS. Delson then comes across a jumbo vision that acts as a portal for these angels. When Reggie escapes the lair, he says that this is something that only Delson can deal with and he leaves. Delson calls Eugene to tell him that he's about to infiltrate the angel conduit's lair, but Eugene tells him not to, but his words fall on deaf ears. You really think Delson's gonna listen? In the basement, we find a bunch of arcade machines, computer and television monitors, and various electronics thrown about. There are also vests from DUP detainees here, so that means we're in the right place. All of a sudden, while Delson is investigating the basement, he somehow gets transported to some weird dimension. It's got lava, gothic-style architecture, and these weird blue things that shoot you upwards. What in the world is this place, and how did we we even get here? Then out of nowhere, a giant angel that goes by the name He Who Dwells attacks and we're locked into combat. Okay, this is a pretty cool boss fight. You can't stay on one platform for too long because it'll fall into the lava and drain your health. What you have to do is circle around this guy and hammer him with attacks whilst he fires off a laser beam that deals a lot of damage when it lands. It's kind of like the laser beam that the ice conduits from the second game used. This laser will stay on Delson unless you can find some cover. There are also these crystals in the arena that you can drain in case you're low on health or if you need to switch to another other power. Occasionally, some angels will swoop in and try to throw you off, but like I said earlier, it doesn't take much to kill them. As much as I love this fight, it tends to overstay its welcome. It drags on for so long because he who dwells has so much HP and your attacks don't even do a lot of damage. In all of my runs of this game, including the footage you're seeing, I've spent at least 20 minutes playing this fight. Delson manages to take down this angel, and surprise, surprise, the one controlling it turns out to be Eugene. We grab hold of Eugene's hand and we get a look at his past. Eugene was a shy person in school, but despite keeping his head down, he was still targeted by bullies. Because of the bullying, he sought solace in video games, his favorite being Heaven's Hellfire. In that game, he felt like he was in control. He was the one who made the rules. 
One day, when one of his bullies pushed him over the edge, Eugene lashed out, unleashing his powers on them. You know, I've been thinking about this, but aren't your powers supposed to be activated if a ray sphere goes off or if you've been exposed to ray field radiation? In First Light, Fetch's parents discovered her powers years before the events of that game, but she never explains how they activated. Was she exposed to ray field radiation without even knowing? Did another ray sphere detonate? That's never explained. Now that I think about it, Delson's ability to copy other powers was also active at the start of the game. Did he also unknowingly come into contact with ray field energy one day? We don't know because the story just forces things things like this to happen. Anyways, Eugene is caught by the DUP and he's sent to Curtin K for 6 years. During that time, Eugene was tortured. He was hooked up to machines and forced to summon his angels. When the prison he saw it as a chance to disappear, but after seeing the DUP rounding up conduits, he felt that it was his duty to save them from what he went through at Curtin K. Delson wakes up and Reggie is back in the basement. He congratulates Delson for getting a kidnapper off the street, but Delson argues back that Eugene is actually rescuing people, not kidnapping them. Reggie is a bit more lax this time and he agrees to allow Delson to take Eugene under his wing. Just like with Fetch, you have two choices, help Eugene build courage by going out and rescuing people from the DUP, or teach him that might is right and show him how to use his powers against anyone that wrongs him. Delson tells Eugene to hang back a bit while he and Reggie have a talk. Delson's confused about why Reggie throws out his by the books philosophy when it's convenient for him, and he also calls out his blatant hypocrisy, saying that it makes him no better than Augustine. His words seem to have gotten through to him because Reggie doesn't even have a rebuttal. Reggie backs off and lets the two conduits have a conversation in private. Delson says to Eugene that if he can show him how to use his newly gotten video powers, and if he tags along to go and rescue some people, he'll show him how to talk to women. Eugene is reluctant, but Delson responds by saying that it's his life, but there will be a way for conduits to live in the real world if he just gets out there. When Delson makes it back to the streets, he tries testing out his new powers and, uh-oh, he can't use any of his powers. He phones Reggie and tells him to meet him at an alleyway. The two get together and Delson confirms the situation with Reggie. Your help, man. Wait, slow down. Did you say you lost all of your powers? Yes, I lost all my powers. I, I, I lost smoke. I lost neon. I never even got Justin, video. this is great. This is great news, man. What the hell is this great news? I've got a thousand dupes after me, and I've got nothing to go on. Remember, we said we were going to find a cure for you, and this is it. I mean, all that bioterrorist stuff, it's gone. Nelson, we can go home now. Tell me the truth. If you were me, would you just quit and go home? Absolutely. If I were you. Yeah, Reggie is a really shitty person for this. I get that he doesn't like conduits, but his whole tribe was just preyed upon and tortured by someone far more powerful than them. Hell, at the start of the game, Reggie even confirms with doctors that the concrete can only be removed by someone with that specific power. It's almost as if Reggie doesn't care about the people he claims to want to protect. If that's the case, then why even sign up for the sheriff's office? Reggie knows that Delson isn't going to stop pursuing Augustine, so he decides to help him out despite the odds. Delson asks if he can borrow his gun to open the doors to the the core relay machine, but Reg refuses. Then Reggie takes his gun out and lets off a couple rounds at it, opening the machine saying that he'll let him borrow some of his bullets. So you mean to tell me that the whole plot point about Delson losing his powers went nowhere? The guy panics and was desperate enough to call his conduit hating brother to see what he can do about it, and all it amounted to was us finding out that Reggie is a shitty person and two bullets solving the problem. So what's new? What new powers do we get this time? Invisibility, a sword attack, angel wings, bloodthirsty blades, Delson going fully automatic, and Hellfire Swarm. The invisibility power allows Delson to create a clone that distracts enemies while the real him is invisible. This ability is great for flanking a whole squad of enemies and catching them by surprise. It's also good for fleeing a group of enemies that are too tough to tackle all at once. The sword attack is arguably the best melee attack in the game. Delson's windup is a bit slower than its other melee attacks, but it's worth it for dealing some serious damage up close. The Bloodthirsty Blades is a grenade launcher with heat-seeking capabilities. You paint a dot over whatever you're aiming at and the blades will hone in on and set off an explosion. This is really good for taking down enemy vehicles or taking down multiple enemies at once by setting off an explosion from another object such as a car. I'd say that this is the best grenade launcher out of all three powers. Delson's standard blast is now fully automatic, which makes it useful for mowing down multiple enemies at once or chipping away the armor of tougher enemies. Finally, the Karma Streak power we have, Hellfire Swarm, has Delson summoning a bunch of angels above the enemy and crashing down on top of them. I'm not a big fan of the visuals personally, but hey, at 
least he can put an end to a gunfight. After obtaining the powers for video, Eugene hits us up and asks if Delson can help him out. That Russian gang from earlier, the Akurans, have kidnapped some of the escaped conduits from that convoy, and they're planning on selling them back to the DUP. Delson goes there, beats up some bad guys, and some DUP choppers show up to pick up the conduits and shipping containers. All the while, Delson keeps throwing jabs at Eugene for being a shut-in. Not really the best approach when it comes to trying to get a recluse to get out more. When Delson corners the DUP in a park, they pull out all the stops against him, and Delson tries asking Eugene for some backup, but it's gonna take some time for him to create more angels. Eugene instead decides to fly over to where Delson is at while he's transformed as he who dwells from earlier. He swoops in to help you kick some serious ass, and the park is eventually cleared out. Delson meets with him on a rooftop, and Eugene says that he's finally gonna open up a little and give people one more chance. And then he leaves. Oh yeah, Fetch and Eugene, you're not gonna see them until the end of the game. Why even give them these kind of character arcs if they're not gonna have a hand in the plot until the very end? Fetch at least got a DLC, but Eugene, he never got one. I wish that they also gave him the first light treatment. Maybe it could take place before and during the plot of Second Son. It'd be nice to see Eugene slowly overcoming his social anxiety, his fear of interacting with others, all while he does his part to rescue fugitives from the clutches of the DUP. Hell, they could even throw in some new challenge maps where you can now play as all three characters. I can only imagine what Eugene's own arsenal of abilities would be like. Another issue I have with the characters being underutilized is that you will almost never see the three of them working together, save for the endgame. In Infamous 2, despite Nyx and Quo being at odds with one another, they still teamed up to take down Bertrand and the Militia. Here in Second Son, the only time you'll ever see this trio ever team up together is at the end of the game. These characters all have great potential. Delson, Reggie, Fetch, Eugene, all of them. To see them being built up just to be underutilized is really disappointing. With Delson's arsenal fully expanded, it's finally time for him to go and confront Augustine so that he can save his family and friends. Cause I have, well, I have lost myself Can't be somebody else I never wanna be like well, I never wanna be like you While running around Seattle, Reggie tells him about a disturbance in town and asks him to look into it. It must be something that the DUP doesn't want anyone to see because they even ordered the Seattle PD to stay away. Delson arrives at the scene where it looks like a fight took place. He picks up the helmet of a DUP agent and listens to a recording of their comms. The agent says that they have a man with the surname Daughtry in their sights. That's right, Henry Daughtry, the conduit who gave Delson his powers. For a while, the brothers assumed that Daughtry was killed by Augustine when she encased him in concrete, but no, he's alive and he's here in Seattle. Fetch calls and says that she sees someone with Delson's powers going on a rampage in downtown, and he tells her to wait on a rooftop so that they can meet up. When they get together, Delson tells Fetch about Henry, and he asks for her help in taking him down, and Fetch says no. Well, what a big help you are, Fetch. Delson heads towards where the fight is taking place with the goal of capturing Henry. The two fly around town, with Henry not showing any sign of giving up. Their pursuit ends on a rooftop, with Henry knocking out Delson and taking his phone number from his phone. Henry calls and apologizes for knocking him out and explains that he wanted to make sure Delson was calmed down before talking to him. Delson asks for Henry's help with taking down Augustine, and right away he's on board. That's all it took? Well, it's not like this is going to be a setup or anything. When Reggie is told about their partnership, he's immediately suspicious and thinks it's a trap. Near a waterfront, Delson calls Henry and asks if there's any way to get past the electric barrier set up at Augustine's tower, and he points us to a transformer that's heavily guarded. And then Henry, out of nowhere, tells us that Fetch and Eugene got picked up by the DUP and tells us to meet him at a pier after sunset. Totally not a setup at all. It's crazy how the game just casually drops that on us. Hey, I can help you find Augustine. Oh yeah, and by the way, the DUP just captured your friends. If Fetch and Eugene were more developed, I'd definitely care more about what's happening to them. When Delson calls Reggie and informs him about the situation, Reggie says that a lot of innocent people have been dying lately, and he doesn't want to add to that just to save Delson's friends. He tells Delson to call him when the raid is over so that they can get back to Salmon Bay, and to watch his back around Henry since he doesn't trust him. Delson makes it to the pier where Reggie is waiting. Reggie admits that he finally sees conduits as people, and he's willing to go along with this plan. Henry arrives, and there's some brief tension between him and Reggie before they resume planning out this raid. The plan is for Delson and Henry to distract the DUP while Reggie rides a boat to the dock. Henry thinks Reggie is suspect because he's the one going in first, and the two have a WWE-style stare-down before Delson breaks it up and executes the attack. When the two make it there, they begin the first step by destroying the support pillars on the outside to draw the attention of the guards. On the way up, the two come across a core relay, and Henry tells Delson to drain it, but Delson feels like something's not right, only to have his suspicions confirmed by Augustine, who encases his hands in concrete. Yep. 
Henry was working with Augustine this whole time. Who could have seen that one coming? And then out of nowhere, Reggie turns into a total badass. Oh, lady. When my brother finds out what you did, oh, he is gonna... He's gonna what? Oh, you could have hit me! Yeah, that's payback for blasting me with the angels. Now come on, get up. Come over here, I'll get those cuffs off you. Augustine is taken down briefly, but Delson's hands are still encased. We have to get to where Reggie is at while being pelted with gunfire with no means of defense. When we get to him, Delson's legs are then encased by a DUP agent, but Reggie manages to pacify the threat with an RPG. I love how Reggie, this small town cop, just casually wields an RPG like it's nothing. Reggie breaks open the concrete cuffs with his RPG, and right behind him is Fetch and Eugene just silently and awkwardly hanging there. They don't even acknowledge them when the cutscene starts. While the brothers are trying to free the two, Augustine comes out of nowhere and shuts the cage tight. She encases Reggie's feet and uses the cage to destroy the platform they're standing on, leaving both brothers hanging on for dear life. What you're about to watch is one of the most unintentionally comedic death scenes ever. Where's he? Does. Nelson, look at me. You gotta let me go. No, I can do this! Listen, can we can't this. let can this, this stuff get to you two. Dad, I'm so proud of you. No. Always have been. No. Lindsay, don't. I love you, bro. No! So, Reggie's death. Let's talk about it. To say that his death was rushed, unearned, and awkward would be an understatement. Think back to Trish from the first game. She was Cole's girlfriend who ended up breaking up with him because she thought that he was the one that caused the blast in Empire City that killed her sister. Over time though, she realizes that she can't just blame Cole for everything and she has to let go of her anger towards him at some point. After she's rescued, she reconciles with Cole and the two are back together. Later on in the game, Trish gets kidnapped by Kessler and Cole fails to rescue her. In her final moments, Trish prays is Cole for being selfless, for being a force of good and trying to keep people safe. And that's all if you're playing the good route. If you're playing on the evil route, Trish doesn't forgive Cole, and in her last moments, she says that she despises him for the horrible things he's done and was ashamed of his actions. In Second Son, on the other hand, Reggie, no matter if you're good or evil, will still say that he's always been proud of Delson before letting go and falling to his death. If Karma played a better role in this game, Delson's actions having an effect on Reggie overall would have made for interesting dialogue between the two since they're so close to each other. In the evil route, Delson has attacked and killed countless innocent people. I don't think that's anything to be proud of in anyone, Reggie. Karma having no impact, combined with Reggie being a flat character, all but made his death feel shallow in the end. A cheap way to deliver an emotional moment so that the stakes can be raised without any effort whatsoever. Getting back to the story, Reggie falls into the waters below and Delson climbs back onto the platform angry and grief-stricken, ready to go head-to-head -head against Augustine despite the odds. Augustine is basically a souped-up version of the DUP Bishop soldiers. She surrounds herself in concrete and floats around on a rock. All you've got to do is just wait for an opening to deal damage to her. After pummeling her for a bit, the game cuts to a news report showing live footage of the destruction from Delson and Augustine's fight over the Puget Sound. The news makes it seem like Augustine was the sole survivor. She was last seen retreating to her tower. On the streets of Seattle, lots of demonstrations in support of the DUP are cropping up. Delson escapes back to the city, angry at himself for falling for Henry's trap that led to Reggie's death, and he swears vengeance on him. Then he goes on a warpath throughout Seattle, taking down DUP agents one after the other and demanding to know where Henry is at. Suddenly, Delson remembers that Henry's number is still in the incoming call logs on his phone, and he uses that app that Eugene gave him to trace it. Listening in on Henry's phone, the DUP are in the middle of setting up a boat ride for him, but they're running a bit late. Sounds like he's getting ready to skip town. As time goes on, Henry is getting increasingly desperate. The DUP contact on the phone with him says that he's not helping him anymore because he hates conduits and he lost a few of his friends to them, leaving Henry to fend for himself. Another conversation reveals that Henry is retreating to the marina, killing every agent that gets in his way. Delson makes it there on time and subdues Henry. When confronted about the whole ordeal, Henry says that Augustine was never going to hurt anyone and she was going to talk, but she's known for having a sadistic streak. It turns out that Augustine was holding Henry's daughter captive and using her as leverage. Henry tries and fails at taking down Delson, and right on time his daughter shows up on a boat. You have the choice to either spare or kill Henry. 
Delson is about to choke the life out of Henry, but he releases him from his grip. Henry offers Delson a ride out of town, but he says no, leaving behind the marina. With Henry being responsible for Delson's reservation being in shambles and somewhat having a hand in Reggie's death, I'm honestly surprised that Delson didn't throw a haymaker at Henry for even offering that. Henry got innocent people hurt and killed because he led the DUP and Augustine into a fishing village minding its own business. If anything, Henry deserves some kind of comeuppance for what he's done, but it no longer matters. His story ends here at this marina. With all loose ends tied up, it's time to begin the final act. Delson makes way for Augustine's tower in downtown Seattle, and over a live broadcast, Augustine is heard giving a speech about how dangerous bioterrorists are and that it's time to take back Seattle from them. Response from the people in the streets depends on your karma. If you're good, then the people will start calling out Augustine and write off her speech as propaganda. If you're evil, everyone will agree with Augustine that bioterrorists need to be purged. Augustine tries dragging Delson's name through the mud and trying to make people scared of him by saying that he's going on a murderous rampage throughout Seattle, when in reality, Delson is acting in self-defense and not even attacking civilians. We arrive at the tower and we have two choices, keep Augustine alive and expose her for what she really is, or get revenge by killing her for what she's done to Reggie and the Akomish. Delson decides that he wants to expose Augustine to the world, and he begins his assault on the news building, knocking down one DUP agent after the other. Fetch and Eugene show up out of nowhere, making this the only time all three of them team up together. These guys were absent for a majority of the game, and now they want to help out? Anyways, not much else happens in this level, it's just a big gauntlet of enemies. Delson dashes high in the air and smashes into a skylight over an atrium. Once inside, he confronts Augustine about her past actions. It turns out that Augustine staged the crash at Salmon Bay, and she wanted the convicts to escape to Seattle so that she can make the people fear conduits and keep the DUP in business. Before the prison convoy, the DUP had captured a majority of conduits and was about to be shut down, but Augustine allowed a few conduits to escape so that her organization has an excuse to keep receiving funding from the government. Not only that, but another reason why Augustine is rounding up conduits like this is because she wants to protect them from the military and angry mobs. She believes that this is what's best for them, whether they know it or not. And then, Augustine screws up this entire franchise's canon in one sentence. Did you know? that over half the conduits who died in the bloodbath seven years ago were killed by the military. Unless this game takes place in some kind of alternate timeline, this does not make sense at all. The RFI was created and used to wipe out every single person with the conduit gene in existence, even if their powers never activated. How did half of those people survive the RFI's activation? Augustine reiterates her point about wanting to protect conduits by putting them in Curtain K, and Delson says that despite her intentions, he's still gonna expose her for the whole world to see. The fight begins and it's just like last time. Hit Augustine when she's exposed, kick her when she's on the ground, rinse, repeat. When Augustine is brought to the floor, she sticks her hand out and allows Delson to absorb her concrete power and were treated to her backstory. Seven years ago, Augustine was a soldier in the U.S. Army who was deployed to take on the Beast. During the fight, the Beast fired off its Rayfield blast, killing everyone in the area except for Augustine. When she woke up, her powers had activated and she found a survivor, a little girl who also had powers. The two walked around a lawless city where lynch mobs were rampant, always on the lookout for conduits. When the military returned to the city, Brooke and that girl were treated as threats. Augustine was torn. She had to choose between the military or protecting people like her. She captured that little girl, bringing her into the military. Doing this earned the trust of the government, and as a result, they started funding the DUP. If she was going to protect conduits, it was gonna be behind the walls of Curtin K. Now, I won't lie, this alone made me interested in Augustine as a villain. What started as a noble cause spiraled into something sinister. All of this, all of her propaganda, the DUP, the lockdowns, martial law, everything, it was because she wanted to keep conduits safe. The thing is that Curtin K is anything but a safe haven. Going off of what everyone has said about it, Augustine, somewhere down the road, started doing sadistic experiments on conduits. I wish we knew why she started doing these kinds of experiments, but we don't get that answer, which kind of sucks because she's a villain with great potential. The two get back up, and Augustine repeats what she told us beforehand, and the fight continues. Delson is pretty much defenseless because he needs to drain a core relay to activate his new concrete powers. So we phone Eugene for some help and ask him to drop some into the arena. For the concrete powers, we get Boulder Dash, Concrete Shrapnel, Concrete Thrusters, and Concrete Barrage. Oh yeah, you'd better get used to these powers quickly because you're gonna need them for this fight. Boulder Dash is a unique dashing power where Delson cloaks himself in a boulder and runs around while also being able to knock objects out of the way. This is great for taking down APCs or any kind of roadblocks the DUP sets up. Concrete Shrapnel is Delson's standard blast turn fully automatic. 
except it does more damage than usual at the cost of draining your energy faster. The Concrete Thrusters are arguably the best flight ability in the game, since it has more hang time than Smoke, Neon, and Video. And finally, Concrete Barrage is a heavy-hitting projectile attack that sends five discs of concrete hurling toward the enemy. Augustine's final boss fight isn't that difficult. All she does is take the form of some giant bug, rolls around, and throws rocks at you. Now I'm gonna talk about the evil ending first, because I don't want this to end on a bleak note. If you want to skip to me talking about what happens in the good ending, skip to the timestamp shown on the screen. Delson encases Augustine in concrete and throws her off the rooftop of that news building. With Augustine finally dead, who was going to stop Delson, Eugene, and Fetch? Delson's next plan is to go to Curtin K, free the prisoners, and shake the hands of every conduit on the way out so that he can have access to a near limitless supply of superpowers. Before he goes there, though, he heads back to Salmon Bay to save his tribe. Delson arrives, and Betty is not happy to see him. She saw footage of Delson slaughtering innocent people on TV, and he says that he would do anything to take care of his own, but Betty doesn't buy it. Then she disowns him and says that he is no longer part of the Akomish. Delson tells her that they'd all be dead without him, but Betty shuts the door on him anyways. He backs away stunned, angry. Then he kicks off an orbital drop, targeting the longhouse before the screen cuts to black. Wow, <laughs> what a dark ending. Everything that Delson did in Seattle to try and save his tribe was for nothing. He came back home expecting to save his people, only to be turned away. Then he goes and massacres every single one of them. Oh man, oh my god. Now that that's taken care of, let's move on to the canon ending. Delson encases Augustine in a concrete shell, leaving only her eyes visible. The DUP is now dismantled, and the world got to see Augustine for what she truly is. A monstrous hypocrite with a sadistic streak who hurts, kills, and tortures innocent people under the guise of wanting to protect them. If she truly wanted to protect conduits, she would have made Curtin Kane to more of a rehab facility than a prison. Augustine is hauled off, and Delson manages to get people and conduits to coexist. All the conduits imprisoned at Curtin K are now free, not only from the prison, but from conduits constant oppression and persecution. Delson heads back to Salmon Bay and goes to see Betty. He greets her on her bedside and he makes the concrete in her body disappear. Betty is incredibly happy and she asks where Reggie is at and Delson tells her about his death. The final shot is of Delson making a stencil in memory of Reggie Rowe and walking off. Infamous Second Son was one of the first PlayStation 4 games I bought. I got my PS4 on Christmas of 2016 at 17 years old and I was ecstatic. I'd finally get to play the games I'd been missing out on in the three years the PS4 was out at the time. A month later, I would pick up Second Son and Bloodborne with leftover Christmas money. I was excited. I'd finally get to see where the story was going to go after Infamous 2. Then, disappointment came. The gameplay was alright, but the story and characters were so mediocre. I wanted to see what the next step was for this franchise, and all it amounted to was decent gameplay, a terribly written story, and awful, awful characters. My biggest gripe with the story is how badly it messes with the continuity. The game takes place after the events of the good ending of Infamous 2, but it feels like it's supposed to take place after the evil ending, where Cole gains the powers of the beast and marches from state to state destroying cities and activating conduits. This is especially evident when the developers have stated that they wanted a sequel to Infamous 2 to take place after the evil ending, but they decided to dial it back a bit after seeing that the trophy data of Infamous 2 showed that most players went with the good ending. The screen time for each character character outside of Delson and Reggie is abysmal. People like to joke about Haru's low screen time in Persona 5, but at least she has the advantage of good writing and development on her side, even with how she was awkwardly introduced. Eugene and Fetch, on the other hand, are flat, bland characters who start off with great potential, only for it to be squandered once their story arc is wrapped up. What doesn't help is that they're absent for a majority of the game. All in all, I was very disappointed with Infamous Second Son. I had high hopes for it, but it didn't deliver. It's time to switch gears and talk about Infamous First Light. <laughs> Infamous Second Son hit store shelves in March of 2014, selling more than 6 million copies and going on to become the ninth best-selling game on the PlayStation 4, right behind Ghost of Tsushima, another Sucker Punch title. After its release, Sucker Punch began working on a standalone title called Infamous First Light. First Light is a prequel taking place three years before the events of Second Son. 
This time, there were no surprises going in. Sucker Punch was already familiar with developing games for the PS4, which meant that they could work on First Light without worrying about any issues regarding limitations or any other kinds of roadblocks. According to Nate Fox, the reason why First Light was released as a standalone game was because they wanted the story to be something everyone can experience, whether or not they have the main game. I get what the dev team was going for, but personally, I think that it's a bad idea to play First Light before starting up Second Son, because you'd be missing out on some things regarding the the story, characters, and setting. Abigail Fetch Walker is the main lead, and she's voiced by Laura Bailey. Fans really fell in love with Fetch when she was introduced in the main game, and her popularity managed to surpass Delson's. A lot of players loved her design, attitude, and her tragic yet interesting backstory. Sucker Punch decided to expand on Fetch as a whole, show players more of her personality, motivations, goals, struggles, and what brought her to where she is. When writing Fetch, Nate Fox consulted with Laura Bailey for pointers on how someone like Fetch would handle certain situations in the story, and they also asked her to give an opinion from a woman's perspective regarding Fetch as a character. Nate also allowed Laura to do improv if she didn't like a certain line of dialogue, so long as the improv line made sense. At E3 2014, Infamous First Light was revealed to the world on June 9th, and it was set for a worldwide release on August 27th of that year. Let's dive deep and take a look at Fetch's life before Second Son. Infamous First Light opens up with text giving players a bare-bones rundown of the origins of conduits and the DUP, and then it cuts to a snowy forest in Washington State that houses Curtin K Station, a prison where conduits are held. The camera pans in on Fetch, who is being asked by a distant voice to tell her about everything that happened leading to her detainment. We're then brought to a pier outside Seattle just two years prior, where Fetch and her brother Brent are loading a boat. Their plan is to use that boat to sneak across the border into British Columbia, Canada, a place where the DUP doesn't have jurisdiction. Their conversation gets cut short when a security guard with a flashlight shows up, and they decide to hide in the boat. Fetch wants to use her powers, but Brent disapproves. Beforehand, Fetch and Brent agree to keep her powers secret in order to avoid drawing attention to themselves, since a conduit sighting always results in a persistent manhunt from the DUP. Fetch decides to act as a distraction and leaves the dock behind with the police in pursuit. After shaking off the cops, Fetch calls Brent and he says that they need to get out of Seattle now before the DUP arrives. Frustrated with the secrecy, Fetch demands to know what kind of job Brent is doing so that she can speed things along. Brent then tells us to break into some guy's penthouse and steal a red duffel bag full of money. When she's in, she stumbles upon a break-in that's already happening. Well, that's gotta be awkward. The owner of the penthouse is dead, and the intruders want no witnesses. I'll go over combat once we get access to the open world itself. Fetch fends off the intruders and finds the duffel bag on a bed sitting next to a briefcase. When she opens the briefcase, it turns out to be a bomb that was just seconds away from detonating. She manages to survive the explosion and falls down to the street below, and Brent calls asking if she's okay. Brent tells us that those intruders were the occurrence, those Russian gangsters we briefly fought in Second Son. He says that if they knew about the penthouse, then they most likely know about their boat and tells Fetch to run back over to the dock. When she gets near the dock, Brent warns her that the occurrence are all over the place and they're armed. He doesn't want her taking them on because she'll be vulnerable if she has one of her panic attacks, but Fetch assures Brent that she'll be fine. Fetch makes it to the docks, and their boat is just exploded. Brent is nowhere to be seen, and she tries calling his phone only to find it ringing just a few feet away. Fetch starts freaking out, but she fights off her panic attacks by forcing herself to recall good memories. When the siblings first arrived in Seattle, the two slept under an overpass where they read comics with a flashlight until they fell asleep. While they were sleeping, someone tried stealing what little they had, and Fetch was about to use her powers on him until Brent stopped her. That night, the siblings established what they call the rules, where the number one rule was no powers, no matter what. Sure, they were going to lose some stuff, but to them, that's better than losing each other. Fetch tries keeping herself from losing control, but it's too late. She freaks out and accidentally kills a security guard on the dock. We're brought back to Curtin K, where Fetch reveals that every time she has one of those episodes, she wakes up with a new power like she's a Saiyan. The person she's talking to is none other than Augustine, who asks her to demonstrate her powers in a training facility. Augustine has us use our powers on holograms made by Eugene. I'll go over these arenas in more detail in a bit. One of Fetch's new abilities is being able to quickly dispatch enemies by shooting a marked weak point on their body. After demonstrating her powers to Augustine, Fetch sits back down and resumes telling her story. 
Fetch searched through all of Seattle looking for Brent, but she couldn't find him and she returns to what's left of their boat. A strange man on the dock walks towards her and asks if she's seen a man with a mohawk. Fetch asks the guy if he's in with the occurrence and he says he's not and then he starts rambling about how they keep kidnapping his people. Fetch gets ecstatic and she wants to help find out who took Brent, but the strange man tells her that getting wrapped up in all this is a bad idea. When Fetch tells the man that they're siblings, the guy changes his tone and says that his name is Shane and that he knows Brent. Fetch isn't in the mood for small talk and she threatens Shane and he says that Brent might be at a spot on the east side of town. Before leaving, Fetch tells Shane to give her any weeds he's come across through Brent's phone. While in town, Shane calls and says that Fetch needs to pick up the pace before the Occurrence start making their next move. Taking on the Occurrence with this kind of power level is a bad idea, so Fetch unleashes an insane amount of neon across the city, creating both a collectible and a minigame in the process. Neon Womans and Woman Races Neon Womans are kind of like the blast shards from Infamous 1 and 2. They're scattered around the city, and each woman you collect gives you a skill point, which can be spent at the skill tree for upgrade. The Woman Races have you chasing down Neon Womans. They move very fast though, so so Fetch has to touch these clouds of neon to speed up, and when you catch up to it, you'll be rewarded with, you guessed it, skill points. Another thing that'll reward you with skill points is completing challenges in either Seattle or the arena. Fetch's game of tag seems to have drawn the attention of the occurrence because they pull up on her immediately after she gets the lumen. Fetch also has a karma streak ability, except it's called Neon Singularity here in First Light. To build up the meter, you have to attack enemy weak points. Once the meter is built up, Fetch unleashes hell on the enemies. The Neon Singularity produces, well, a singularity that sucks up anyone unfortunate enough to be in the area. Depending on what direction you're moving in, the singularity will sweep up whatever it comes near. This is a good power for clearing large groups of enemies that are overwhelming you, and it's also great for taking out enemy vehicles like APCs and whatnot. Shane gets on the phone and says that he needs help with stealing a stockpile of guns from the occurrence. If Fetch helps him with this job, Shane will have his men all over town looking for Brent. Oh yeah, and Fetch also says what everyone's been thinking this whole time. Great, thank you. And enough with the feelers. I get it, you're a creep, okay? Let's move past it. Uh, now, now, I will have you know that some women find me irresistible. Sure, if you're paying them. Now that we can freely run around Seattle, it's time to talk more about the gameplay. Aside from there being less concrete and very little DUP presence, Seattle is largely the same as it was in the base game, except now you're barred from accessing the second island. Fetch's style of play is largely different from Delson's. For starters, Fetch has access to abilities that were never present in the base game. She also starts the game off with a few powers that you had to grind for when first obtaining Neon in Second Sun. The side stuff consists mostly of lumen races, collecting lumens, and destroying roaming police drones with cameras mounted on them. What gives First Light its longevity are the challenges and battle arenas. If you're a fan of score attack modes, then I'm sure you're gonna love these. The arena is an endurance mode where you have to survive as long as you can while shooting for a high score. Taking down enemies increases your multiplier, but if you wait too long before taking down another enemy, it depletes. What makes this mode so engaging is fighting to keep your multiplier from going down while also trying to stay on your your toes and avoiding being swarmed by enemies. It forces you to assess risk. Let me give you an example. If I'm low on neon or if my health is low, I'll need to find a panel to charge up at and get back to fighting before the timer on my multiplier expires. I could either take my chances and keep the multiplier alive by taking down one more enemy before dashing off at the risk of dying from a few more shots, or I could run, charge up, and rush my way back to where the enemies are at all before losing my multiplier. It's stuff like this that keeps me coming back to the arena. There are also power-ups that'll occasionally be dropped into the arena. Purple gives you invincibility for a short time, yellow doubles your multiplier, green gives you unlimited melee finishers, and blue gives you super bolts, where Fetch's standard neon blast deals a greater amount of damage. The arenas are split between three difficulties, alpha, beta, and gamma. There's also two modes, which are survival and rescue. Survival is just that, survival. Rescue is basically survival, except occasionally you'll have to save a hostage from being killed by the enemies. If the hostage is killed, you lose a life and it's game over if you lose five hostages. You can also play as Delson in these arenas, but I never did that because running the smoke moveset in this environment feels clunky. Of all four powers you use in the base game, smoke is the least practical for this occasion. The arena is cramped and less open than the streets of Seattle, and Delson's mobility while running the smoke moveset is limited. His smoke dash can only move him a few feet away, and there's a slight delay when when Delson lands after dashing, leaving him open for attack, 
especially when you're cornered and need to move past some enemies to get to safety. Neon and Video, on the other hand, are perfect powers to use in the arena since they're powerful than smoke and have practically better abilities for moving around. One thing that's always bothered me about First Light is that karma was completely removed. There's no good or evil karma, there aren't any karma opportunities, there are no major choices, and there are no consequences for your actions. You could clear an entire block of civilians and the game won't punish you for it. Karma is what made Infamous so unique. Playing as a hero meant going out of your way to heal civilians, taking down bad guys, restraining enemies instead of executing them. You get the idea. Playing as a villain meant hurting and killing civilians, treating innocents as collateral damage, executing downed enemies, and just being an all-around menace. Here in First Light, Karma not being present just makes it feel like something's missing. Imagine the choices Fetch would be forced to make, her dialogue, and how she deals with the outcome of her actions. Getting back to the story, Fetch meets up with Shane in an alleyway. We pretty much have to stand on the roof of a truck and protect it from the occurrence. As the chase goes on, Shane says that he has an idea but he needs to time it right and then he radios one of his men asking if the bus is ready. And then they ram a bus through an intersection to block off any pursuers. Once the guns are dropped off, Fetch grows frustrated and asks Shane if there's been any progress on finding Brent, and he says that he already has guys combing the streets for him, and he sends us their location. While I have the chance, let me just say that Shane is a really annoying character. I get that he's supposed to make the player annoyed and uncomfortable, but the way he's written feels so juvenile. The guy is from Texas, but he's written more like a stereotype. Ironically, Travis Willingham, Shane's voice actor, is from Texas. What did you say? Texas is dumb? Don't you dare take the name of Texas in vain! You mean we can't say anything bad about dumb old Texas? No, you can't! Oh, then can we say people from Texas are dumb? No, you can't say nothing about Texas! I get that he's like this on purpose, but there are intentionally unlikable characters that are way better than Shane. We get to the spot where one of Shane's guys is being held up at gunpoint by the Occurrence, and Shane says that he's gonna call his men back since the Occurrence are hunting them down. Fetch tells him not to do that, and then she starts taking down the Occurrence. Every now and then, there will be these missions where Fetch becomes a human sniper, and you have to neutralize any enemies you see before they kill the hostage. I wish these were made into side missions because this is really awesome. Shane's crew is really bad when it comes to the discretion part of being a criminal because another one of his guys is being held up at a different location. After rescuing the second guy, Fetch suggests that Shane use his men as bait to lure out the occurrence so that she can distract them while Shane gets his men out of the neighborhood. Fetch dispatches them, and Shane says that he has a lead on Brent's whereabouts. An occurring lieutenant making collections was spotted on CCTV. If Fetch finds this guy, she'll be another step closer to finding her brother. Once at the destination, a woman named Jenny phones us and says that she's going to be helping us out with this op. Jenny is a city worker and tech specialist who also works for Shane. For this mission, we're going to be tracking down this lieutenant using camera footage as reference. The occurrence have a facility where they house prisoners. If we track this guy's movements back to the safe house, we might be able to find Brent. Jenny is working for Shane because she quote unquote needed something, but she doesn't reveal what that something is. She then warns Fetch to not get in too deep with Shane in his line of work. Observing the camera footage, it turns out that the lieutenant we're tracking is a human trafficker working for the occurrence. He's following the woman seen in the recording so that he can kidnap her and force her into a sex slavery ring. Yeah. First Light goes to some really dark places. The disturbingly unsettling part is that the CCTV footage we're looking at is reminiscent of how human trafficking victims in real life are stalked and kidnapped. From the kidnapper keeping their distance, the victim slowly noticing that they're being followed, all the way to the victim being attacked and thrown into a vehicle that quickly speeds off. As the footage goes on, the woman starts to flee and she tries asking for help, only for the poor guy to catch a few bullets. The chase ends in an alleyway where the occurrence throw her into a car and drive off. We arrive at the location where this all went down and discover that the guy from the camera footage has dropped his phone. Seattle must have some of the most dense and incompetent criminals in the world. This dude really snatched someone off the streets and then leaves his phone at the scene of the crime. Not only did you do that, they got your ass on camera. Niggas ain't got me in no fucking camera. This is the clearest video I've ever seen. This is the most HD shit ever. This is 4K. How did they get you in 4K? That ain't me. After retrieving the guy's phone, Jenny says that she'll be able to get a look at his whereabouts and movements if we give her the SIM card. Shane calls, and surprise surprise, more of his men keep getting jumped by the occurrence. Fetch happily obliges, and she even asks for the location. After bearing witness to what she just saw in that security footage, Fetch's reaction is totally justified. 
Fetch gets there and notices that none of Shane's men are out there, and we're told that the occurrence forced them away from the spot, and they have them pinned down near the ferry terminal. Shane starts to wonder why Fetch is so bloodthirsty, but she says that she's doing all of this for Brent. He isn't buying it. Shane thinks that Fetch enjoys slaughtering the occurrence because he saw the look on her face when she was taking them down, although how he could see her face, I don't know. Fetch tells him that she has it all under control and their conversation ends. At the sniper perch, we have to provide covering fire for Shane's men and keep as many as we can alive. Once this job is done and once Jenny finishes looking at that Akurin guy's phone, we can rescue Brent. The Akurins are taken down, but that's not the end of it yet. Shane needs Fetch positioned elsewhere to assist his crew, and he also says that this arrangement of theirs isn't over. He thinks that Fetch is a valuable asset for helping him move product and acting as muscle. The thing is that Fetch is only doing this for Brent. She's got no interest in whatever the hell Shane's got planned after she finishes helping him. Over by the Space Needle, Shane's men make one final stand and the Occurrence pour in, getting taken down one by one by Fetch. The Occurrence are eventually cleared out and Shane says that he saw the fight and he still thinks that Fetch has a more sadistic side to her. Fetch shoots down this accusation and says that she doesn't do this because she enjoys it, she's doing this to get her brother back because she doesn't want to lose all that she has left. Jenny finally got the data from the Occurrence phone and Shane knows where they're keeping their prisoners. It's time to get Brent out of there. Fetch climbs onto the truck that Shane is driving, and just like last time, we have to keep it safe from enemies. Once at the spot, we're told that the dock has shipping containers full of prisoners and we'll have to bust open each one. After busting open the shipping containers, we get a call from Brent. He managed to escape from the docks, and now he's hiding from the occurrence. The situation takes a turn for the worse when the DUP arrives in Seattle and quarantines the area in search of Fetch after getting reports of conduit activity in town. She leaves the docks behind and tells Shane to meet up with her at Brent's hiding spot. Fetch and Brent are finally reunited with each other after all this trouble, but sadly, this reunion is cut short when Shane holds up Brent at gunpoint. Shane makes a deal with Fetch. If she does a few more jobs for him, he'll let Brent go. Then he throws Brent into a van and takes off, leaving behind a saddened and enraged Fetch. Fetch is about to have another one of her panic attacks, but she clings onto a memory to keep herself together. She talks about what it was like being homeless and how she got hooked on drugs. Now in Second Son, both siblings get addicted to drugs and Fetch kills Brent in a drug-fueled rage because she thought he took her stash. This is where things get weird. Here in First Light, Fetch says that the two got addicted and Brent, noticing that things were getting bad, wanted Fetch to get clean and he hid her supply. In spite of this, however, Fetch never killed Brent. Now I'm really confused. I'd honestly just chalk this up to Fetch's memory being so foggy due to the trauma she's experienced. Fetch can now use Stasis Blast. Augustine has us run around the arena like usual and then it's back to the plot. We're back where we left off. After Shane took off with Brent, he ran the occurrence out of his territory and set his sights on the chief of police. He's going to try to force the chief to work for him. Fetch knew that Shane was never going to let Brent go, no matter how much work she did for him. She needed a plan B. With more DUP troops showing up in Seattle, Fetch had to act fast. Shane gets on the phone and tells Fetch that the DUP have been rounding up more of his men, and then he starts blaming her for them getting captured. These are the same guys that can't even avoid getting held up by some random gangbanger. If they can't even do that, Lord knows that they're not going to survive against DUP patrolmen. Fetch finds a DUP command center that's been set up in town overnight. Okay, wow. Now that's record timing. I wish we had construction crews that worked as fast as this on I-95. Anyways, Fetch finds a command center and sets Shane's guys free while also busting up some DUP agents. Shane congratulates Fetch for a job well done, and he rewards her by letting Brent on the phone, but only for a few seconds. He warns her to get out of town before the DUP catch up to her, and then he's forced off the phone. Shane gets back on the phone and tells Fetch that if she keeps doing good work, he'll let her talk to Brent for a little bit longer, but if she pisses him off, he'll torture Brent. Jenny calls Fetch and says that Shane is never going to release Brent. Shane is too good at his brand of blackmail and manipulation. If you have something that he's looking for or needs, he's going to strong arm you into giving it up. His connections and manipulation tactics are too powerful to say no to. However, Jenny is able to provide some help, but she can only do so much. We head to the Pacific Science Center and Jenny sends an app to our phone that allows us to see a live feed from nearby police drones. Shane is about to gain control of these things because he has the Seattle PD on his payroll. If Fetch wants an easier time looking for Brent without Shane's eyes and ears all over the city, destroying the police drones should be a good start. 
Going on a scavenger hunt for these police drones is just like the surveillance camera missions from Second Son. You have to use clues in the environment to narrow down its location. When asked about why she's helping out, Jenny says that she's in too deep with Shane's business, but Fetch doesn't have to be. We destroy two police drones, survive a DUP ambush, and Jenny rewards our efforts by putting more side content on the map and telling us that she has a good lead. Shane moves around prisoners regularly, and with his crew taking over that slice of Seattle, he's been trying to let the city know that there's a new gang in town by throwing people into shipping containers. Brent might be in one of these, so it might be worth checking them out. Fetch also needs to act fast since Shane consistently requests updates from his men. If Fetch isn't fast enough, Shane's gonna become suspicious and wonder how Fetch knew about the shipping container. The two start bonding and Jenny says that once they're done with this business in Seattle, she'll tell Fetch about what led to her working for Shane. The Seattle PD have more patrols than usual because of what Fetch did to that DUP command center earlier. The DUP haven't declared martial law yet, so the police are doing what they can without any assistance from the DUP to catch whatever conduit they come across. The shipping crate has no one in there, so Fetch rushes over to another one. Out of nowhere, Shane calls, but he isn't suspicious of anything yet. All he does is make fun of Fetch's panic attacks, and she hangs up on him because she's in a hurry and she's being chased by the cops. Just like the last one, this crate has no one in there. Jenny says that there's one more crates and we run like hell across town. She also broke into Shane's computer to find out where he's keeping Brent. Major props to Jenny for that. She's risking her life to save the lives of two people she barely even knows because she doesn't want to see another victim of Shane's go through the same situation she's currently in. Jenny knows how brutal Shane's blackmail can be and she's willing to risk it all just so another person isn't forced into a never-ending cycle of slavery for an agreement that was never going to be upheld in the first place. In spite of him being perverted, juvenile, and completely foul, Shane is an admittedly charismatic character, and he uses that trait of his to his advantage. When first meeting Fetch and learning that she's related to Brent and has superpowers, he acts more friendly and approachable, lying to Fetch and manipulating her to do his dirty work. After Fetch inadvertently leads Shane to Brent, the mask comes off and he can finally use her as his personal weapon when he needs things done, whilst using her brother as leverage. I'd like to imagine that the same thing probably happened to Jenny. Shane lures her in with the promise of whatever she's looking for, asking her to put her skills to the test for whatever task that fits her skill set. Then, at the last possible moment, Shane switches up on her, sentencing her to essentially a lifetime of doing his dirty deeds. This is all my own speculation, of course. Fetch makes it to the last crate. Nothing. Turns out that this was all a setup. Shane started growing suspicious right after Fetch destroyed those police drones, and the only people who would know about them are him, Fetch, and Jenny. Fetch pleads with Shane to not hurt Jenny, and he sends her the location of Jenny's phone. When we make it there, we're greeted to the sight of Jenny's lifeless corpse. Shane reminds her of their deal, and he says that if Fetch tries anything like this again, or if she stops taking orders from him, he's gonna kill Brent. Well damn, that kinda sucks. I was just starting to like Jenny too. Shane tells Fetch to get on a rooftop and check out the camera feed. Turns out that Shane already paid off the Seattle PD for access to their cameras. He wants Fetch to create a diversion around town for the cops so that he can go and meet the chief of police and force him into his business. To do this, we have to cause a ruckus and force the police to respond. This actually would have made for an excellent karma moment. Fetch could either wreak havoc by destroying parked cars and random objects around the city, or she could make this go by faster by outright killing cops and civilians. Once Fetch has the Seattle PD's attention, Shane calls her over to the police station so that she can be his sniper and protect him from anyone converging on his location. Fetch dispatches the enemies like she always does, and the chief gets on the phone saying that he'll give Shane the same deal he gave the occurrence, she just has to leave Seattle. Shane tells her that Brent is being kept at a building a few blocks away. She can pick him up, and they won't have to deal with him anymore. We make it to the handoff, and what do you know? It's a trap. Poisonous gas starts pouring in, making it hard for Fetch to breathe. The reason why Shane is trying to kill her is because the DUP are making moves in Seattle. Since he has the chief of police by his side, Fetch is pretty much a liability to him. Keeping her around would only draw more attention from the DUP. Whilst gasping for air, Fetch starts freaking out and she has another flashback. Brent really wanted Fetch to get clean, and he felt like leaving Seattle would help. He started doing dangerous jobs for dangerous people, also that he can afford a boat and sneak into Canada. Fetch didn't have any faith in this idea until Brent came to her one day with missing teeth. After seeing what happened to her brother, she knew that she had to get clean. Brent has stuck by her side since the beginning. She can't lose him. Fetch's powers become amplified and she breaks out of the building. Now we can use Missile Salvo. Augustine isn't happy that Fetch has been holding out on her, only telling her about the powers she gets as the story goes along. Fetch demonstrates her new power to Augustine, then she sits back down and tells her how this all ended.
Seattle wasn't safe for the siblings anymore. Fetch knew that Shane would come looking for her, so she had to go on the offense. She wakes up from her panic attack and goes on a warpath looking for Shane. While Fetch is on her reign of terror, she picks up a wireless headset off the body of one of Shane's thugs and listens in on the chatter. His crew is moving around drugs via freight trucks. If Fetch destroys these trucks, she might be able to get Shane's attention and draw him out of hiding. Fetch annihilates the first truck, with Shane getting on the phone shortly after. She cuts him off and says that she just blew up one of his drug shipments and isn't stopping anytime soon, and then she hangs up on him. The second shipment is destroyed and Shane threatens to hurt Brent, but Fetch calls his bluff. She knows that if Brent died, Shane would have no leverage over her. The third shipment goes up in smoke, and Shane asks why she's doing this, and Fetch demands that he give back Brent. Shane offers to set him free under the condition that Fetch turns herself into the DUP. Yeah, we know that's not gonna happen. Shane would definitely kill Brent the moment she gets detained, so Fetch just keeps on doing what she's doing. Truck number four goes down, and this time Fetch calls and gives Shane the work. Oh, hi, I'd like to order some drugs. Oh, wait, you don't have any. DUPs are on you. They know you're after my cargo. All you can do now is run. You think they might be interested to learn what your cargo is? It's kind of federal offense illegal. I don't care about me. All they're interested in is the freaks. Shane kind of has a point right here. The DUP probably cares more about rounding up someone who can shoot Neon out of their hand more than they would care about organized crime. Well, that's if you can call Shane's line of work organized crime in the first place. At the same time though, with the kind of power and reach the DUP has, their main goal of rounding up conduits hasn't really stopped them from enforcing the law. The final drug shipment is destroyed, and Shane gets so pissed off that he tells Fetch to meet up with him so that he can settle the score. Fetch runs to their little meetup spot and gets ambushed by Shane, whom injects her with a hallucinogenic drug. All of a sudden, a light shines on Fetch, and it's a raid by the DUP. The longer she fights, the more blurry her vision gets. Fetch eventually begins seeing her childhood home, and starts recalling the day her parents called the DUP on her. Everything is a haze, and more painful memories start flooding in. Fetch blindly fires at these white shapes that are trying to attack her. The hallucination ends, and Fetch comes face to face with Brent, whom was badly wounded by Fetch during the drug trip. She apologizes profusely, but Brent accepts her apology, saying that it wasn't her fault, and then he dies in his own sister's arms. This is how Brent really died. We cut back to Kurt and Kay where Augustine tries confirming everything leading up to that point. The DUP found Fetch in that building and had no trouble bringing her in. Augustine asks Fetch if she would kill Shane if given the chance. Then a door opens and Shane walks in wearing an orange jumpsuit, believing that the DUP took him in by mistake under the belief that he has powers. Augustine wanted Fetch to relive her painful past so that she wouldn't have any trouble killing Shane. Fetch jumps forward in a fit of rage and fires a powerful neon blast at Shane, destroying a wall leading outside. She wakes up from her blackout to see that Shane is somehow holding his own against the DUP. Then he hijacks an APC and flees Kurt and Kay, with both the DUP and Fetch in hot pursuit. Fetch picks up a walkie-talkie and goes to wherever the chatter said the APC was last spotted. If she really wants to catch up with Brent's killer, she's gonna have to brave the frigid, snow-blanketed forests of Washington. In Fetch's mind, though, it'll all be worth it in the end. As as Fetch continues through the mountain, the DUP have finally noticed that she's escaped, and now their focus has shifted to detaining both her and Shane. A drone sent by the DUP catches Fetch in its sight, but then it turns around and starts moving in the opposite direction. After following it for some time, the drone breaks down and Fetch drains some neon from it. Fetch then gets near a ledge and unleashes her neon singularity on everyone down there. Whoever called in sick that day must be having the biggest sigh of relief in their lifetime. She touches down and finishes off the remaining forces. After taking them down, Fetch follows a convoy alongside a highway where they're gonna try to box in Shane. Listening in on the comms, the DUP is trying to get Shane to pull over, but he tells him that he's running from Fetch and he's not stopping anytime soon. The DUP starts firing rockets at Shane's vehicle and they successfully land a hit that causes Shane to crash. They're also turning up the heat by sending in concrete agents to attack Fetch, but she fends them off without breaking a sweat. Fetch checks out the crash site, but Shane is nowhere to be found, so she braves the snow storm and charges ahead. Shane finds himself at a dead end with Fetch cornering him. He tries talking his way out of this, thinking that Fetch will let him live after all he's done. Come on, honey. What do you say, huh? Find a way out of here? Got him. We fucking got him. <laughs> right where we want him. Is 
say that, Brent? I want to make this right. Once Jane is dead, the game cuts to when the remaining conduits are transferred from Curtin K Station to a military base, leading into the introduction of Second Son. And that's the end of Infamous First Light. For as much flack that I gave Second Son's lack of character development, I think that First Light did a decent job at expanding on Fetch as a character. We get to see stuff like how her brother really died, what they were up to before she was detained again, and how her losses truly impacted her. I wish that Eugene got the same treatment. Sure, he's the least popular amongst all three conduits, but I want to see his expansion play out similarly to how Fetch's did. I would have loved to have seen his backstory, you know, how he struggled with bullies and social anxiety, and see him help out the fugitives that were detained by the DUP. That alone could have been a side activity in the open world too. And the battle arenas, imagine what they could do with Eugene's exclusive set of abilities. I'm getting off topic though. My biggest gripe with First Light is that the karma system isn't present. The issue with that is that everything you do around the city doesn't have any consequence whatsoever. You don't get punished for attacking civilians and wreaking havoc, and you don't receive any good karma for restraining enemies or performing non-lethal attacks. All in all, Infamous First Light is a slight step up from the main game. Well, that wraps up my coverage of the Infamous franchise. It's been a wild ride covering these games. I had a lot of fun replaying them and doing all this research for the series. As I've said before, the Infamous games are a unique take on the superhero genre. As amazing of a sequel that Infamous 2 was, I definitely think that the franchise should have stopped there. With Second Son, I think that it's better off as an interquel, taking place at the same time of the first two games. The story just forces itself to happen, which is why through some form of deus ex machina, conduits have returned. I'm sorry that this video took longer than usual to be released. During the production of the Infamous 2 retrospective, my family and I were in the middle of moving and we were temporarily staying at a relative's house for several months. Because of that, I actually lost the motivation to record voiceover. Thankfully, once we got settled into this new home, I finally regained my confidence and motivation and, well, here we are. Thank you all so much for being patient with me. That's all I have to say for now. It's been fun covering these games. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe because I have several major projects in the works. If you want to keep up with what's going on behind the scenes, make sure to follow me on Twitter and to join my Discord server. Links to all of that are in the description. I'll be seeing y'all in the next video. Thanks for watching.